from the depths of cold, inky blackness come the screams of madness as we pass Neptune and dive into Uranus. Beware the call of the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm every week. We bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekiverse and to play a game with us. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode are my co-hosts, Mike Kafis and Stephen Wallet. Our guest this week is Andre Krupa. Andre Krupa has been steadily running role-playing games since 1979. His theatrical training includes many years of lighting design and hands-on production electrics work for professional and community theaters, where he has also spent a lot of time in the booth running lights and sound. Using both his own material and scenarios designed by others, he is known for ramping up his games with elaborate the theatrical lighting, sound effects, music, and props. And he has a new game out, Lucid Dreams Role Playing Engine. Uh, this intro is a little different than normal. Um, normally, I have the guys uh, or g gals, whoever whoever's on the show, are my co-hosts and, and guests. Uh, you'd be able to see them, and you'll you'll see them in a minute. You'll see how the format changes when I switch over. Uh, that's usually how the show begins. Uh, if you're new to this, the first time you ever seen one of these episodes. Uh, but we had a sound issue where I could not be heard, and as the host, that's a little problematic. Uh, I fixed it while the show was running. We lost. Uh, I'm looking at it right now, about six minutes of. The the beginning of the show um but it was it was just uh, uh nothing really important nothing too important uh it's just usually the opening show banter between me uh and the hosts and the guest uh so anyway what i'm going to do is i just i'm just going to cut that part out i thought about dubbing in uh something or or, or trying to explain uh what was the questions that were answered but it's not necessary uh we're just going to start the show with uh with with Andre answering a question that I had asked in the last it's the last piece of uh, a video where you can't hear my voice um, and what I asked him was uh, about the horror system in his game I thought it was really interesting and he's going to go into uh, some of the the aspects of the horror system uh, what happens to characters uh, when they are exposed to horror and the options that are available which I thought was a little uh, a little unique for a role-playing game something I hadn't really seen done quite the way he did it may exist but uh, but I haven't seen it. So um, so anyway, I'll just let Andre answer that question. Oh, sure, sure. So if you see some horrible thing, uh, more often than not, you're going to make a courage roll. And that courage roll, mechanics-wise, has two components, a fear test and a horror test. So collectively, it's considered a horror a test. You'll roll. Um, if you fail the fear roll, um, your options are, and I just happen to have my little chart here, uh, you might, well, if you do well, of course, you can continue to act. If you fail a little bit, you'll be afraid. You won't be able to go towards whatever it is, but you'll still be able to act. Um, if you're horrified, truly horrified, you'll have to retreat from the thing, but still in a somewhat orderly fashion. If you're terrified, you flee in panic. And if you're truly petrified, you're rooted on the spot in fear, which is the worst result. And if you fail those roles badly, you tend to also have a horror component where you will go crazy or demented. Um, so demented is a minor level of insanity. It happens, you have an episode, and then it fades away when you're able to get into a place where there's not a lot of stress. Uh, but if you go insane, that sticks with you. So the options for demented are things like swooning or going blank or being in denial. And I, I try to put little role-playing tips with the results. Um, and then if you go insane, I kind of broke it down into classic cosmic horror insanities. So the system isn't really designed to reflect realistic mental illness, but instead those moments where characters go crazy uh, in cosmic horror stories. And so those options are things like amnesia or multiple personalities or being delusional. And in my game, there's a very sharp line between a few different levels of temporary or short-term insanity and going insane. When characters go insane, they never actually can completely recover. All they can do is managed to cope better with proper treatment. 
Okay. So that's All pretty right. much how it works. Ooh. And oh, I try hey, to provide yeah. role-playing tips to make it exciting, you know, uh, handouts that I'll have. I don't think I can really show you, but um, you get the idea. Role-playing Pretty. tips, that sort of thing. All right. Hey, I just I, I was looking at a message in the, yeah. cha- in the, in the chat room that said that uh, they couldn't hear me, but I think I fixed it. As usual, it's some setting that changed itself on the software that I had never touched, and I fixed it while we were talking, I think. So I just want to make sure that people can hear me uh, now. Yeah, fair I'll enough. Have to re- I'll, I'll have to recut the intro when uh, <laughs> when we – I'll have to fix this video later. We're going to keep moving forward because I can do – it's not oh, that big sure. a deal. Um, so I just want to make sure people can hear me. Um, I can see it on my screen. It looks okay. Uh, is there anyone – can hear now. Okay, fantastic. All right. Sorry about that. Sorry. All right. No, it, no worries there. Stupid ass software. Oh, if it's not one program, it's another, Mike. All right. Um, I run a lot of things to make all this work the way it does. All right. I'm so, sure. um, so you you do you know you you do a lot of uh, immersive role playing, uh, which we talked about with the lights and the uh, you know the sound effects and such, uh, and you have a lot of equipment to make that happen. Um, because I've seen this whole setup you do, and and it's pretty amazing. And Steve, you you saw it last year, right? You didn't play in the game, but you did see it, right? Well, oh no, and he's gone. He was and he's gone. All right, well, well, let's. Oh my God, we are we are a wash of technical. You know, I think the great ones are are watching, and they they are influencing our our stream here. Uh, we're talking about dark things here. <laughs> so so tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about the um the the immersive playing that you do. And Mike, you've seen this. Yes. Well, so basically, as far as setting the stage or setting the scene goes, I use a bunch of theatrical instruments uh specifically i use a pair of rock light par cans that are red green blue and white as far as the colors they can throw and then i use a pair of uh, sorry four smaller par cans which i set down on the floor that go red green blue and amber and then i also have a dimmer pack which i use to run lights I hang over the table and basically what I do is I turn the room into a role-playing theater so that you can have you know um, various looks day looks night looks a sunrise a sunset thunder lightning artillery blaster fire Um, and I also these days utilize um, for a sound board an audio board i use an ipad now and i have an application that allows me to play sounds on demand so a gunshot or a scream or something like that and i also play backing tracks with music and that sort of thing and i think a lot of that helps to set the atmosphere a great deal um although you know one doesn't necessarily have to do all that at home if you don't have the gear being able to just control the lights a little bit and play some sound goes a long way Right. Yeah. Now, Steve, uh, you're back again. Are you okay? <laughs> I am good. I don't know what okay. happened there. All right. That's fine. So you, you've you seen this setup, but you're you're going to be playing it for the first time this year at TotalCon, right? That is correct. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Andre set a room up for you. Now, I've, I've never actually played uh, – or he set up an event for you. He's got a room he sets up. Um, I've never actually played in Andre's game, but I've watched, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing. I can never seem to make it happen. I'm going to try and sign up, though. Yeah. I'm going to try and sign up because they have, uh, you know, the register. I've been watching the registration. Uh, it's going to be tricky because I know, a lot, I know your games are popular. So as soon as the registration goes live, I'm going to see if I can get in on one of the nights that I'm actually going to be there. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Sounds good, good to me. And if that doesn't happen, maybe we can figure something else out during the course of the year, potentially. Okay. Well, maybe. It's a bit of a drive for me, but we'll see. Yeah, I hear that. <laughs> I hear that. Although we do some stuff in Mass and Rhode Island sometimes, so maybe we can work something out. Rhode Island. Yeah. Uh, we could maybe make Rhode Island. What do you think, Steve? How far is that? Seven hours. Seven. Go oh, south. That's, that's pretty far. Bring it south. <laughs> Bring it south. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Hey, Mike did eight today. We can do seven. Yeah, pff, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame you can't make it to Gary Con. Gary Con's a good time too. But I mean, you're gonna be a total con. I'll be there. I'm oh. gonna see if I can swing it. I'm gonna. We'll see. We'll see. Sounds good to me. Sounds good All to right. me. I'll be running a bunch of the Lucid Dreams role playing engine there this year. So, I was gonna ask: Are you running your own thing? Or are you mix, I mixing am. it up? Or what do you, well, I always pack? mix a, a little bit of stuff up. But, yeah, I'm running a bunch of sessions of my game, and I'm also running a couple sessions of Cthulhu Invictus as well. 
So. All right, cool. I tend yeah, to you- run. Oh, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was just going to say I tend to run a fair amount of stuff that I write, but I do a lot of flavor text and whatnot to try and frame the game a certain way, and it takes a fair amount of work. So I tend to also run a lot of other people's material as well when I'm not running my own game. Right. Yeah. I've, I tell you, um, I've, I've play, I like playing Call of Cthulhu at conventions because it, I, I feel like you get the right atmosphere um, in that you're playing a character that if the character doesn't survive, that's OK. You know, it's not like you're it's not like you've bought into this character. And I think you can get the real feel of horror because you're not really you're, you're trying to do what your character would do. And you're not worried metagaming in saving your character. You know, you're like, you can just play yes. and, and whatever happens, happens. You know, if, if you lose, no big deal. And you actually get to immerse yourself in that horror element, which is cool. You mean when your character doesn't survive. <laughs> well, they can, they can survive. They can. Sometimes, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Depends uh, on the scenario. Uh, let, come on. Let's talk statistics, gentlemen. Yeah, well, statistically, <laughs> uh, a Call of Cthulhu game is uh, TPK. Uh, yes. <laughs> generally, some people survive. It, it's usually not pretty. And some wish they didn't survive. Uh, yeah. And right. I, uh, See, that's the thing. That's the thing. You know, dying is not the worst thing that could happen to you in that game. <laughs> well, I think with Cosmic Horror, with Cosmic Horror, people have certain expectation already but it also i think because of the nature of things um it creates a situation where where people need to cooperate um and and what i like about it uh which is a little bit different than a lot of traditional games is it's not about the loot it's about being the unsung hero it's about uh saving people who would not even know you saved them it's about taking risks that you would never normally take um, with an outcome that is most likely going to be going mad and then dying. And that's <laughs> part of the whole fun of it, you know? That's the, yeah, um, exactly. And one thing that I try to do with my rule system, with the Lucid Dreams role-playing engine, is create a toolkit that can people can use to frame that experience, especially in a longer game. So not only do you have things to help define the character and round them out, like uh, merits and flaws or gifts and whatnot, which is pretty traditional, having gifts and faults. Um, But there's rules for organization and training and that sort of thing. So you might be able to build a detective agency or a feudal thief or a division of a company or a branch of an esoteric organization and know what skills they teach and what skills they don't teach and what perks are available and what duties that you need to do in order to fulfill your role within the group and the organization. Let me, let me um, ask and you. I, also, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, do yeah. you, would you, would you be, is this something that you would license other people to develop for? Is this something you'd be interested in doing that with? Oh, I think potentially. I haven't quite gotten far enough, I guess, to really go too far down that route, but sure. I know I have a couple of local friends who have some pretty cool Call of Cthulhu scenarios, or I should say Cosmic Horror, sorry, Cosmic Horror scenarios mm-hmm. that uh, I think, um, oh, but yeah, I'd certainly probably be interested in talking about that. So Absolutely. What do you, what do you, Steve, what do you think of this? I should, maybe I should ask the guys from... Uh, from TriTech, you know they, they've got they've they've got um, Bureau Thirteen, which they were thinking about, um, you know, doing for uh, doing using trying trying to get a license for Savage Worlds, uh, but honestly. I think Bureau 13 would do well with this system. I think this is I think this would be a good system for Bureau 13. What do you think? No, this system would be perfect for Bureau 13. Going through it, it's a lot of similar concepts. Definitely a good fit. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sounds- let me let me. I'm gonna ask them, Andre. I'm gonna ask them see if they see if they'd be interested in that. But I wouldn't ask them unless you'd be open to oh, even entertaining that. Sure, that, that sounds that sounds promising to me. Okay, let me That's let me see if they're right. interested. Sure. Deals sure. are brokered. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I I don't know if I missed this or not. But the what is the dice system? Did I did I? So no, it's a it? it's a very simple system based on detents. The okay. whole game kind of grew out of a much, much crunchy or more detailed system. And basically what I did is I pared everything down until it was as simple as I could seem to make it and still get what I wanted out of it. So in the end, what you do is you roll 
a pair of between two and five ten-sided dice, and most player characters are generally going to roll either two or three dice. Now, if you're not very good, like your skill is zero, one, or two, you're going to have to take the worst of the two dice and add your stat or skill to it. Now, if you're skilled or better, so you have a rating of three in a skill or statistic, you roll the two dice and you'll add, take the best value and add to it. When you become an expert, you'll add another die to the pool. And hmm. when you become a master, you'll add another die to the pool. And should, although it's not generally within the human range, should you become a past master of a skill, you would yet add another die. Although generally supernatural creatures are the ones who get five dice, and it's very deadly because there's a reroll <laughs> system. So the more dice that you roll, the more chance for an explosive result where you roll an ad and you can keep rolling and adding uh, until you run out, until your rerolls stop. Seen in a game so far is four, which I think was a total of like 38 or something crazy, which is a lot. It's a really a lot. Oh yeah, looking at the system, right. That's a high, it's super high number. That's a wicked high number, yes, yes. So, you know, you can get some pretty spectacular results with the re-rolls and the way it works, and it keeps the math quick and simple. Um, so, yeah. All right, I yes. got a question for you. Yep, good sure. stuff. All right, so with the way society is changing, how do you handle things like, um, I mean, most Cosmic Car stuff is NC-17 at best. Okay, so how do you handle sure. things like if you, uh, according to your chart here, give someone sadism and they start role playing this during the course of the game in manners that might be uncomfortable for other players? Oh, well, that's sort of an interesting discussion. I should say I actually have people roll a couple results and then pick the one that seems best suited. Mm -hmm. So you're not necessarily married to a result, but that's not really answering your question. And that is, I think, actually more about the art of running games, right? So if someone's role-playing something in a way that makes other players uncomfortable, well, then you kind of have to say, look, you know, this is great. You're doing an awesome job, but uh, this might not be the best for everybody involved. Um, and maybe walk it back. You know, now your players, right? Yes, yes. If you're with a group that you already kind of know pretty well, you can already have a pretty good idea. And you can kind of just give the you know, look over the glasses, you know, and people will normally that's enough said. But occasionally at a convention, you might have to take someone aside and say, yeah, you know, I don't think this thing you're doing is. I think people are a little uncomfortable with that, but it's a fine line, too, because it's a horror game. So right. some it's supposed to be a little uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> right. Some discomfort is to be expected, but you don't want people being unhappy with the session yeah, right. because of whatever reason. Right. Right. So, I, you know, I could, hey, so I could tell you delicacy. I could tell you without a doubt, our core mm. gaming group, which I'm going to say is, is me, Steve, Corey and John, we would constantly be going, come on, man, step this shit up. Let's go. Let's come on. You are not getting me uncomfortable yet. Let's come on. <laughs> right, Steve? <laughs> that is true. Our game there would is, be no uh, there'd be no brakes, only gas pedal. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> if, well, if, if heads if heads aren't coming off and eyes aren't coming out and you know, uh it, it, we're not it's not a horror game. The players and the characters both need to be shitting themselves. Yeah. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But that can be a fine degree, depending on who the players and the characters are, after yeah. all. But absolutely, absolutely. So, so and hey, always. real quick, real quick, we got we got some we got people in the in the chat room that we've been ignoring. Um, uh -oh. So, so David, you know David Benavides, my man David. Uh, oh, sure, he sure. he's he hey, wanted guys. to know uh, your your events are they associated with Dark Phoenix? Yes, yes, and that's a good question. Hey, thanks for okay. asking. So I, uh, my events can be booked through the Dark Phoenix group. Um, we are putting on a whole raft of games at TotalCon, uh, and we do a bunch of New England conventions. So there's a whole crew of game masters that can do a whole variety of uh, different games and genres and rule systems for people's various functions and events. And that can be found at darkphoenixevents.com. 
Nice. Very good. Very good. Yeah, they are. are they, Dark Phoenix is uh, TSR's friendly competition. And when I say that, uh, I mean it in the best possible way. Uh, we, I think uh, uh, we're, you know, we both try and run really good events for people. And there's plenty, plenty of players and plenty of room to go around. Um, oh, sure. But I think we make each other's uh, games better, you know, as, as we, oh, sure. there's this sure. real super soft competition. You know what I mean? It's like competition in the, in the fact that, uh, we're happy when when dark phoenix does great stuff as i'm hoping they're happy when we do great stuff and i'm hoping we just push each other because like uh i'll tell you james carp so um so so total con is, is announcing its events and um you know, a uh, Dark Phoenix put up this this flyer, this like banner, a Facebook banner thing that had all the events and was like, "Come play in Dark Phoenix and stuff." And James hits me up on the side, he's like, "Dude, dude, where's our banner? We gotta have one of those. What are you doing, man?" <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had to I had to put one together, and, and I'm I'm hoping I one up them, and then I'm hoping to see like in the next week that that uh, I, I guess is it Dave who, who who's sort of the uh, the the head wrangler of Dark Phoenix. Well, that would be Scott and Petra Legault primarily. Okay, well, I'm hoping yeah. that Legault will see my banner and go, "You son of a bitch," and like do something else that's really cool <laughs> too. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Which is good because it's good for the players because that that's my the only competition I have is oh, to be sure. better than I was last time I did something. You know. Mm-hmm. So and I want to mention cool. that that uh, Dave Benavides guy has been stalking me, and I feel very uncomfortable that he's followed me to the show. Oh, oh my you, god! <laughs> you gotta watch that guy. Yeah. Holy cow, he's a mellow guy. Very friendly fellow. No, we love yeah. Dave. Holy we... cow. Holy cow. Da- Dave I it's Mike, is Dave is Dave the, the Mythwit super fan? Does he is he get that award? I mean, because your mom is kinda there too. Yes, no, they both are. And I mean he gets the uh he's 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 the number one fan, he's cuddly. I don't know where Steve gets off saying that Dave is uh, a threat at all. He's super friendly. No. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. He was he was posting on Facebook today about my plant that was dead on the front porch. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, oh you, know you had no business having a marijuana plant on your porch yeah. in the first place. Right, you ain't in Colorado, bitch. Now, uh, so, so if you look, you I've, I've got Mike out back, man. Out back is where you grow that. I got Mike on the main screen. If you look. Up, right, if you're looking at the screen and you go up and to the right, you'll see a dice bag hanging there that says oh. "Total Confusion." He's representing. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. There it is. I've got one of those. Yeah. 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 So, uh, <laughs> all right. So let's let's talk a little bit about Lucid Dreams. Let's, you know, we you mentioned the dice a little bit, and and you know some of the courage and, and fear rolls and stuff. Um, so this is a generic system, you know. I was, and, and I have to admit, I I had assumed and assumed wrongly, obviously, that you were going to do something that was horror based, like a, a system that was, you know, like a setting that was horror. Because just because you run Cthulhu and stuff and you do it so well, and I and I was like, oh, Andre's going to come out with his own version of that. But you, you did as generic, which is which is really cool, is is very awesome. I was I was pleasantly surprised. Um, so so tell me a little bit about like um, some of the mechanics. Like for example, I noticed the damage. So we figured out that we got the skill rolls and stuff. Um, maybe go a little bit more into two things: the the skill rolls, because I know how much dice you roll, but then what? You know how? What's what are my difficulty sure. numbers? Uh, right, what do right. I add to that? And then uh, maybe you could run me through like what it would take to hit somebody. And then when you go to do damage, how does damage work out? Because I was look, I was reading through it, and I thought damage was kind of cool the way you did it. So. Um, okay. So okay. let's go through that. Let's go through like a, hitting somebody and doing damage. So Okay, hitting somebody and doing damage. So if it's a melee, you're going to make an opposed skill roll. So you'll roll your die pool uh, if you have a skill of three or better, and let's hope that you do. Let's just say for the sake of argument, both characters have at least a skill of three. So you're going to roll your two ten-sided dice, and you're going to pick your best result, or at least you may and probably want to pick your best result. There are occasionally times when you might not want to, but usually that would be like if you're sparring or something. So let's say you rolled a seven, you have a skill of three, so you have a ten. And let's say you're hitting me, and for a defense roll, let's say I roll a two and a four, and I also have a skill of three. So you've got a total of 10. I rolled a four, and I add three to that for a seven. So 10 versus seven. So you have beat me by three. In me, oh, 
I don't actually have my charts with me, but let's say you're hitting me with a melee weapon that's a, a plus five damage weapon. So you're in by three, plus five, so you do eight points to me. Okay, so eight points is enough to put me at hurt. Actually, sorry, wounded minus two. So I would check those boxes off on my damage track, but that will also have exceeded my shock number. So I'll have to make a stamina roll against the amount of damage I've taken. And if I fail that stamina roll, the amount by which I fail it determines my shock result. So I could be nothing, just fine, able to continue to fight, or I might be stunned or knocked down, knocked down or knocked out or knocked out severely. So those are basically the results and it's all from a simple shock roll on a simple table and, and then you move on. So that's okay. basically how it works. Um, and the whole game, the die pools all work the same for statistic rolls, for resource rolls, for experience checks. So for example, it's the kind of thing where you collect checks, you're allowed to collect one experience check mark per scene and at any time you want, you can gamble those check marks against a difficulty. And if you succeed, you'll go up one. Erase all your check marks and start over. And the less skilled you are, the easier it is to go up in something. The more skilled you are, the harder it is. And once you become an expert, it's really hard. Right. So that's right. basically how that works. Um, and I have... Um, abstracted rules for things like wealth, uh, social class, which all characters have to have a wealth and social class rating. So instead of, you know, writing down a detailed list of things, you'll make a note that the wealth is increased by a certain amount. And when you want to buy something, you make a wealth test. And that determines, you know, could you find the item? Could you get it at the price you wanted? And so on and so forth. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so I like that in that, you know, one of the things that I, I thought was really cool was that you don't really roll damage. You, you you roll to see if you hit, and then what you hit by, and you add that in, and, and then you add that to the damage that, that you the, of, of the item. So it's kind of like the better you hit, the more damage you can do, which is cool. That I, I like that Absolutely. a lot. Absolutely. Um, and, and to make it really gritty, it's not like, you, well, I get shot by a gun, but only did one point of damage. Like, no, if you get shot by a gun, it's going to do what the gun does, which makes sense. Right. And then whatever he hits you by. And, uh, and if it's like a sword or something, you're adding your strength in, which is, which is very cool. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's, I, I like that a lot. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, Steve has a copy of this game. Uh, he was going to do a review mm -hmm. for you, I believe for his, uh, for nerd rage news. Um, I'm looking forward so, to it. So, Steve, you had some notes, so why don't you jump in here and ask a question or two? Okay. I had several things. Hang on. Wrong glance. Okay. Uh-oh, he needs his <laughs> x-ray specs. Oh, no. <laughs> his old man specs. <laughs> yes, getting old shit hurts. All right, so let's see. Uh, I was looking at the uh, thing when you're injured, and you have your various wound levels, and then you yeah. have your difficulties for first aid. Now, right. with this, um, what I didn't understand was if you make this roll, how much do you actually heal? So you get back a maximum of two wound levels, okay, uh, unless you get a special success. If you get a special success, it's an additional wound level and a heroic success, one more. But that doesn't happen too often. Um, so, for example, let's say that you were at hurt one and you've taken five points of damage. Someone makes a first aid roll against the difficulty and they succeed by four. You would erase four lines on your damage chart and make an X for that last one point, which now can only be healed through regular healing. So that's basically how that works. But if you've got a success total of nine, you would still only be able to get two damage levels back. So basically someone who has like a broken leg isn't going to suddenly be all walking around because you just can't get them that far back up. So that's why there's a two wound level limit. Okay, and then along with uh, injury, I mean, it, how gritty is this? I mean, the characters, if, uh, if two people just start shooting at each other in a room, what's the odds that they're going to walk out of that room? Well, I guess it depends on what they're using. If they're both using shotguns and then they're at close range, arms reach, then one of them is probably going to be dead before the other can shoot. 
although they might both die. A handgun, it'll kind of depend on how well they roll. Uh, certainly an expert that is most likely to get a re-roll is very likely to kill somebody. But generally the rule system works in that knocked down. Uh, and often, but not always, are bleeding or suffering from shock effects. So a lot of it is about who holds the ground at the end of the fight. And a lot of it is about uh, not getting knocked down because the first person to get knocked down basically loses. You know? Okay. Can, and, I, and can you explain a little bit, like, uh, like I was reading about special maneuvers, how do they work in the game? Well, so special maneuvers, and I have to admit, uh, I'm going to kind of sidetrack for a minute. I have this philosophy, which is instead of detailing the outcome exactly before you roll, you roll and you narrate the results. So generally speaking, it's intended to work that way. Like normally I wouldn't expect someone to say, I stab at their ankle with my spear. Because what's going to happen is, in a fight, you're going to jab your spear at whatever hole presents itself. Maneuver takes you outside that. A special maneuver is a situation where maybe you have to stab the character in the ankle. Or maybe, you know, you're fighting some monster, you have to poke it in the third eye with your spear. So you have to make a roll and get an exceptional success, usually, in order to do something particularly special like that. So it's a pretty simple set of rules for exceptional success or excuse me for uh, special maneuver so it's pretty simple and that's kind of a game master call uh, even though i have a lot of i guess you might say new school elements in the game the game's really designed to present a framework and then you can take it and do what you want with it instead of having a rule for everything okay you know what i mean and um yeah i I did. Uh, you mentioned earlier about insanity, with uh, that if a person goes completely insane, that they're pretty much um, never get over it. So how do you right, handle they, relapse? So uh, that's a good question. Um, well, so first of all, if you care, if your character goes crazy, you can get treatment, and that treatment can be used to reduce the willpower difficulty. Uh, that you have to make in order to not go crazy when suffering a horrific experience after having suffered and acquired this insanity. So that's basically okay. how that works. And then if you run into a situation where you go crazy again, you make a luck test. And if you fail that luck test then you suffer a relapse and a relapse means that the difficulty of your present insanity is increased again so that's basically how that works your character could though end up with a collection of insanities as well <laughs> um okay. you know depending nice. on the circumstance <laughs> <laughs> that's, and it's that's my favorite old... collection you know some people collect beanie babies i collect <laughs> insanities <laughs> <laughs> very good well th those were the main things that i really uh wanted explained i mean for the most part the system looks very solid i mean i didn't have any major problems with it going through it um Excellent. there were a few areas that i wasn't exactly grasping everything and your explanations here helped me get through that oh thanks thanks and you know, and I, I saw the I was looking through the bestiary, and I like how simple that is. And I, I like that you did something that was really neat. You you didn't just create the monster, you know. Or I'm gonna say monsters, mostly animals. So let's say there's a lion, right? We'll take the lion. You have you, know, you have your standard lion. So this is the lion you would normally run into. Uh, you had uh, an exceptional lion. So I guess that's a that would be like a, uh, a heroic lion, I guess, or like just a lion that's that's better than normal. Um, right. You know, and in some cases that would be good for like say for example if you had an alligator and you were like this one's a little bit bigger, a little bit faster than normal. Uh, and then you had just for fun, you had giant because, of course, you know, especially in, in, in horror type of elements, uh, you know, most people wouldn't think of, you know, it's like, well, that's not really a monster. It's just an alligator. Yeah. Yeah. But see, it's a big it's a really big alligator, which <laughs> makes it a monster. Well, because I'm sorry. It's a giant alligator. <laughs> 
Right, right. And that's not uncommon in uh, a lot of weird stories, right? Weird mm -hmm. tales, even if they're not strictly cosmic horror, often feature things like that. And really the idea of the bestiary was to give people a framework so they would know of things to then go ahead and extrapolate and make their own creatures from. Sure. You know, yeah, and I'm, you, I'm you kind of hoping... Though you threw zombies in there, so that that was kind of a monster. Okay. I mean, you, didn't have, right. you didn't have too many monster monsters, but that was cool. I mean, I, I like you said, I, I like that. Um, but you did even throw in, like, say, and this is this is you know an example of, of a, a regular, uh, just straight up monster. Sure, sure. I think I got the werewolf. Uh, oh yeah, yeah the right. werewolf few, was in there. Yep. There's a yep. few. There's a few monsters in there just to kind of give people an idea of what you know can be monstery, and then there's also in the. In the scenario in the back, there's some more horrific stuff as well. Although I'm not sure how much we should actually talk about the details. No, uh, no, don't. Let's not give away the scenario. You know. yes, now, yeah. now, there, there was another thing. Okay, so for me, when I'm playing these type of games, I always like playing right. the cultist, the wizard, the guy who's delving into the stuff he really shouldn't be. So, sure. Tell us how that works in there. The, the, do you have uh, the tomes? Do you have the magic? So I do not actually have rules per se for magic in this system in and of itself. That will come out in other supplements. I tried to create the core rules. Um, so as far as delving into the lore, there's definitely rules for research and delving into lore. And there's a framework in place. I don't specify some specific tomes. But there's a framework in place for doing research and making horror tests when you discover awful things. Um, as far as magic goes, uh, magic is largely left up to the realm of the game master, the way it's set up right now. And generally in Cosmic Horror, the players learn some specific ritual or remedy for some specific circumstance. And the idea is that generally that's going to be scenario specific. Now, I'm kind of letting the cat out of the bag by saying this. But in the long run, I probably will eventually take uh, make a high fantasy magic system available, time permitting. My core test group here at the house has been really hammering me uh, to do a fantasy version. And I have okay. some ideas for that, although probably the next thing I'm going to officially develop is a 10th century Saxon campaign. Um, which is very heavily influenced by Howard. And wow. I start, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm good. No, no. Oh, sorry. I thought you were. Um, and there's uh, a scenario I ran a few years ago called Homecoming, which started the framework for that. Uh, the characters are all Saxons. Uh, they're up in the, uh, the five uh, boroughs region, um, not too far from York. Uh, as they're coming home from rescuing their cow from a cattle raid, things have gone horribly wrong. And that's basically where it begins. The campaign's going to be called The Devil Walks. So that's, that's probably what's next. But I'm seriously considering a fantasy adaptation as well. Uh, basically, the rules that this is based on, uh, I had all of that stuff. But it's way too crunchy for me now. 20 years ago? You know, I was into, let's see, roll a D100, get the calculator. Oh, let's see, your penetration result is this, and right. now you're you're stunned at this level, and you're bleeding this much, and oh, right. what kind of helmet were you wearing? And now right. I'm like, yeah, you know, let's go on. Let's tell the story now. Right, so, right. And there's a fine line between too much and too little grit, I think. Yeah, but, it, it's hard. You got to run that line. All right, so yeah, yeah. we've we've come up on time, but before we move on to the game, because we we got a good game tonight, uh, Steve, okay. I want you to give us just a, a real quick word from a gamer. You, I, I saw you you posted the the version for all his Kickstarter backer types uh, and people who worked on it. Um, so it's it's uh, it's done. It's going to TotalCon, right? It'll be a total con. We'll be doing a showing on Friday and Saturday, and cool. it's been entered into 12 film festivals so far. I'll be entering it in the Gen Con Film Festival when that opens up submissions in another week, as well as about 15 more film festivals that we're just waiting on dates to come around. Nice. Very exciting. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing it. Cool. Yeah, you're, you're in it, Andre. You're, you're, you're in the film. I, I am. I am, yes. or at least rumor has it. 
Rumor has it. Yes. Yeah, and I this show. To see it. Will yeah. there be DVDs available at the Total Con? There will not. Uh, officially, the the Total Con viewing is a uh, a test viewing because okay. for the film festival purposes, I can't premiere it. I have to premiere it at a film festival. Oh, that it's makes for sense. Fair enough. Certain eligibility things. So, uh, oh, oh. what I've done is I've made arrangements where this is going to be a uh, a test screening to see how the public likes it. Cool. As if we're still working on it. Ah, Excellent. Right. Because you it are, for me. Steve. Wait, still but you working are on still it. working on it. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. I will be working on this till I die. Right. Fair enough. Fant- fantastic. <laughs> well, so, I, will be, uh, I will be looking forward to when the DVDs come out, and I'm sure I will try to push them off on as many people as I can. That will be awesome. All right. And I hope to have DVDs out by Christmas. Cool. Sounds good fantastic. to me. And nice. and fans fans of this show, we have a prominent little spot in the movie. It's awesome. It's fantastic. You know, so <laughs> so there's Mythwit's cool. love in the movie. Uh, not only that, but Jay Libby is wearing our shirt, so that's cool. Hey, Mike, we got to get new shirts, man. We got a new logo and everything. We got to get new shirts. Yeah. Oh, there you go. All right. Well, yep. it's it's uh, it's that time. We're going to move on to the game. But before we do that, real quick, uh, you can find Andre's stuff, all of his stuff at. Game Soap Box, G A M E S O A P B O X dot com. Uh, you can find his stuff on RPG Now. Uh, just look for Lucid Dreams Role Playing Engine. And uh, you can find them on Amazon as well. There's a whole bunch of numbers and letters here. I'm they're going to be in the show notes, so just click on the show notes because uh, there's it's a string of things. Um, but Andre, thanks for coming on. Stick around. We're going to play a game with Andre. Uh, let thanks me for having get- me. Yeah, man, absolutely. But don't go anywhere yet, cause we're gonna do the uh, we're gonna do the game thing. Let's see, I gotta do this, and then I gotta do that, and then I gotta do. It's game time with the Mythwits. I'm your game master, Peter Bryant, and on this episode, we're playing Bet the Geek. I have taken questions from H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. Each round, I will ask Andre a trivia question. Before he answers, Andre, it's important, before he answers, I will go around the room, that's Mike, Steve, and myself, uh, and I will ask uh, I will uh, blah, 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 ask each of the panelists whether Andre will get the answer correct or he will get it wrong. We don't have to know the answer, doesn't matter. We're betting on whether Andre knows the answer. Uh, panelists right. must... Panelists... That's me, Stephen Mike, must also hedge that bet by one, two, or three points on how confident we are in Andre, Andre's, Andre, Andre's Cthulhu Foo. Uh, once all the once all the betting is in, Andre will reveal his answer. There will be a total of five questions, and each panelist will start with ten points. Mike will be manning the scoreboard and will update us at the end of each round. The the uh, you don't need to do that because you know what it's in the. I managed to put that in the uh, imagery now, so everybody can see that. Uh, we will start with uh, three warm up questions to help gauge us on Andre's abilities. Good luck, everybody. It's now time to bet the geek. All right, so Andre. I'm going to ask you three questions, okay? These three you can answer right away. It doesn't matter. But then once we're done with that, because Steve, Mike, and I need to know where you are with this Cthulhu stuff. Uh, and okay. then once we get an idea of what you know, what we think you know, uh, I will ask you questions. And when I ask you, do not answer them. You wait for us to Check. bet, and, and then you answer them. Uh, but that's first answer. Answer. Don't What's say that? that now. Tell them that? Tell them that. Tell them that. After, don't answer, because now he has to answer them right away. Yeah, right. Now, yeah. now, I'll remind He's you. No, the only reason I do that is because... First. <laughs> right? yes. The only reason I'm saying this is because I did the whole thing with another guest, and he went right ahead and answered the first one. I was like, yeah. no, 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 no. All right, anyway, so anyway, all right, so you can answer these. All right, so the first okay. one, Andre. If someone were to ask you, excuse me, but have you seen the yellow sign, who would they be referring to? Pastor. Very good. Fantastic. All right, you got that one right, folks. Uh, hold on, let me put the scores up here. You could right. say the king in yellow, though. Sure, the king in yellow or Haster, both are, both are correct. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, question two. Whom did Lovecraft credit with writing the Necronomicon? Oh, the mad Arabelle Duell has read. There you go. Another correct answer. Very good. All right, third question. This one's a tiny bit harder, but maybe not. I don't know. Who is the Eater of Souls? 
Ooh, the Eater of Souls. I want to say Bug Shosh, but I'm probably wrong. That one is Yag Sothoth. Oh, I always thought of him as the opener of the way, the keeper in the gate. Interesting. Okay. Right. He does a lot of things, though. Yag Sothoth. Well, yeah, they things. all they all do. They all do. I try. I really tried to, to to capture the right ones for these. And you know what? If I'm wrong and Andre's right, we're still going to bet. And we're still going to allot the points that way. There's there is no <laughs> whether I'm right or wrong. It is what it is on my sheet, <laughs> right? Oh, right, Mike. I'm sure, it says. Eat, yeah, I'm sure you're right. Eater is so. Awesome. I say that if uh, Andre challenges it, then uh, then it's worth a it's worth a, a look at. Oh, oh there's challenging? God. No, there's challenging? no, Mike. No audibles, Mike. Stop it, Mike. No audibles. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Andre knows more than you do about Cthulhu. Hey, Andre's wrong. I'll there. tell him he's wrong. Hey, well, I there agree. You go. <laughs> I am, this is the Wikipedia speaking, so of course uh, it, it's, oh, it is what it okay. is. It's wrong. <laughs> no, no, I also did go. I also <laughs> did wrong. go. No, I also did go to like uh, the, the uh, Cthulhu wiki. Whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, here we go. <laughs> All right, Andre, do not answer these until we bet. All right, so, Andre, now I'm going to put it on you so we can see your face. Here's your poker face. Which entity is referred to as the Dark Mother? And Steve, I will go to you first. What do you think? Andre is going to know this one or not? I'll bet three he knows it. Three he knows it. All right. Uh, Mike? Uh, three what do you he think? knows it. Three, he knows it, all right? Uh, hmm. Steve was so confident. Steve is my other Cthulhu person, and he... It's kind of hard to bet against Steve. It's kind of hard to bet against two Cthulhu experts. This makes me sound like... As confident as Steve was, it makes me sound like that Andre is going to... He's going to know this one without a doubt, so... Oh, I'm going to say yes, three as well, Mike. All right. All right, Andre, go ahead. Who... What entity is referred to as the Dark Mother? The Goat of a Thousand Young, Shabnigaroth. That is absolutely correct. Fantastic. All right. Uh, I'm not going to let Steve go first this time because it's, <laughs> it's hedging the bets. All right. So this, Andre, this Elder God is served by the Night Gaunts. And Mike, what do you think? <laughs> Gonna... <laughs> this... Could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to help you at all. This elder god is served by the night gunts. The gunts? Oh, well. Night gunts. I mean, three, three, he knows it. Three, he knows it. Okay. All right. Um, I'll go next to keep it fair. Uh, see... <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, Night Gaunts. I'm thinking this is like the god of like uh, of emo kids. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to go. Oh, God, I'm not real confident, but I kind of want to change things up a little bit. I'm going to go one that he doesn't know it. And then Steve. All right. I'm going to go three that he knows it. Three that he knows it. All right. Mike, you got the points in? Yes. Steve said right. yes for three. Yep, go ahead. Okay, so Andre. So, the night gods are usually associated with Nyarlat Hotep, although in some one of the Dreamland stories, they're actually referred to as servants of Nodens. Nodens is the answer I had, so that I'm going to take that as correct. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> All right. Yes. I've read a few stories, you know. Yeah, I figured. I figured. I figured. I figured. All right. So, uh, all right. All right, Andre. Who is the unspeakable one or him who is not to be named? And I'll go first. I'm going to say yes for threes. Got to know this one. Uh, and, and Mike, I'll be fair to you. I'll let Steve go next. What do you think, Steve? <sighs> I don't know, man. I don't think he knows this one, but I'll go three anyway that he does. Three that he does. Three that he does. <laughs> all right, Mike, where are you? Uh, all right, so everyone is three. Yes. Um, I mean, he who is not to be named, that is like everybody knows that that's um, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> uh, uh, not. Oh, God damn it. What is Harry his name? Potter guy? The Harry. Harry no. uh, the, Voldemort? No, uh, uh, 
uh, Beetlejuice. Oh shit! Right. No, that's <laughs> one. <laughs> so I'm going to say, say yes. He knows it. <laughs> For how much? Uh, three. Three. All right, we're all across the board. All right, Andre. Who is the well, unspeakable a, one? That's a bit of a trick question because that goes back to the yellow sign since it's Hester. Hester, very correct. Hester, I knew he knew it. Spoken. Man, you are. Do you know your stuff? All right. <laughs> two more, two more left. All right. Is <laughs> Dave Benavidi <laughs> said Morrissey? <laughs> Got him, emo <laughs> kids. <laughs> I love you, Dave. All right. Is <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Next one. Is Cthulhu one of the elder gods, outer gods, or great old ones? Oh. And, uh, well, all right. <laughs> ah, 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 I'm gonna say it's a one in three here. This one, this one does get some people. It does even get some people who know Cthulhu Mythos as well. I've, I've gotten this one. This is a Cuba Death question. I've I've nailed a couple people on this one. Some know it, some don't. I am gonna say I'm. I mean, I gotta break away. I'm I'm behind both you guys. I'm gonna say I'm gonna go no for three. And Steve, or no, Mike, you go next. All right, uh, I am gonna go. I'm going yes because I'm I'm just I'm all in. Okay, uh, you're on it with Andre. You're so. team Andre, team Andre. All right, and you're Steve, saying no for three, Pete. Okay, yeah, I'm saying no for three. Steve, what do you think? I'm not confident on him on this one. I'm going to go yes for one. <laughs> this is yes where for I one. All right, in. good, good. We're starting to get a break in points here. All right. All right, Andre. Don't fail Andre. me. I'm going to say Elder God. That is not correct. He is one of the great old ones. It's he is so from... Confusing, he was confusing, depending on whose analysis yeah. you read. Well, I, that, I mean, yeah. Yeah, which, which analysis were you using... Well, Here we so go. I, uh, yeah, depending on whose essay, you know, I, yeah. So I, uh, I don't know. I must admit, I get a little hazy with those relationships. A lot of them were added after the mythos was created. And the mythos is supposed to be confusing and not entirely make sense and not be well structured for us. We're supposed to be like, what? Yep. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I know he's not one of the outer gods because he is from Earth. He is the only one that stayed behind. He is the only one of the great old ones that remained on Earth and is sleeping. Right. So, he was trapped. Trapped. Oh, trapped. Okay. Well, trapped. Well, you know, you say stay. I say stay behind. You say trapped. Come on. <laughs> so, right. Right. <laughs> so, all right. Let's do the last one. No. No. He wasn't trapped. He was Mama's yes. boy who was staying in his basement when everybody went <laughs> off to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Andre. But school no. Andre. The last one. Right. This fiery entity that mm. shall release Cthulhu from his prison once the stars are right. Oh, what the hell, Mike? What'd you do? No right? idea. Okay. All right. All right. So anyway, let's let's do this again. This this is the fiery entity that shall release Cthulhu from his prison once the stars are right. Uh, the the one that will actually physically uh, no, because I'm saying this because there's there are connections and you you would probably know this if you know the answer to this. But but this is the one that would actually do it. Uh, and for this last round, Steve, you can go first this time. Well. How many points do I have to bet if I lose, I still win? Oh, that's too <laughs> bad. You should have been keeping score or watching the show. No, no, no. Steve can't see the score. So let, let's do this. That's, Steve, that's his you're own at, fault. Steve, you're at 18. Mike is at 16. I'm at 14. Shit, I'm still at 14? Damn it. All right. <laughs> so, Steve, if you bet, if you bet one... That would be that would be the safe bet, but Mike could still win. I love this because depending on how you bet, anybody can win. If you want to keep me from winning, don't bet more than one. Right. Well, I I want to shut Mike out of this. So I'll bet all three that he gets it. Three that he gets it. All right. Uh, I'll go next. I'm gonna say three that he gets it. The only way I can win is if Steve goes three and I go three. So I'm going to go three that he doesn't only this is game. This is just 
I'm playing the game. It doesn't matter what Andre, what I think Andre can do or not. The only way I can win is if he doesn't get it, and I bet three. So no is three. Mike? Correct. And I am going no for three as well because that will at least then... Fuck you. All right. That will show. So, so it's either going to be Steve or Mike. <laughs> so it's going to be Steve or Mike. All right. I can't win, bastard. All right. So, Andre, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> the fiery entity that shall release Cthulhu. That is incorrect. It is. You unless. Cthulhu? Unless it's some. It's Zindarak, some kind of fiery oh. spirit who's the servant of. Who is it, Steve? Off the giant fireball? Cthulhu. I'll have to look that up. Cthulhu is the giant fireball. Right. Apparently, uh, Zindarak is the, the, the servant of Cthulhu, and that Cthulhu's voice can wake the gods, and as he's going to pass the earth, uh, Zindarak is supposed to be his messenger that will wake him up or some shit. Yeah, know. Zindarak's supposed to be one of the fire vampires, like the leader yes. of the fire vampires. And well, I guess there's Cthulhu. a couple stories I, I yeah. haven't read by somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Like oh, you said, there's I, so much. There's I am so very much disappointed in you, Andre. I'm no, sorry. Are you fucking kidding me? He, he aced all of these except for that. All right. Very wow. good, Andre. So, so wait a minute, Mike. What? what ha I it blipped out I'm for a second on, on the answer. You, he so got the answer. Middle? It's a no, I Mike. It's an as oh. a thought. But so, apparently it's uh, Zindarak. Yes. So, so you see this? See this mug here? I got on. I'm on mic here. Check this out. Hold on. Oh, you bastard! Come on. Mike is our winner this week. Thank you. Thank way. you. <laughs> Yay! You know what? I'm gonna stick Pokemon on you, man. <laughs> yeah, you already it. have. <laughs> you mean again? <laughs> <laughs> All right, fantastic, Andre. Thanks for playing that game with us. Good sport. You are a Cthulhu right. master. Your answers are whew, amazing. I I had to look all this shit up. I had no idea. <laughs> I basically was like, "Am I unsure about this answer?" That means it's probably a good question because I'm, I'm no, a surface knowledge. Yeah. And that's actually one thing that's super cool about the oh. mythos is there's so many contributors uh, and, and now as it's expanding into newer and newer schools of writing uh, it's been taken in all sorts of interesting ways a lot of good stuff out there oh so so new people are picking it up tons of authors yeah oh, man there's all kinds this. of schools there's like you know the new weird and the old weird and oh yeah tons of good stuff all right, so what's what's really good? Give me a suggestion. Like, who who should I read next? Well, I would recommend Rathena Emery's Winter Tide. Okay. However, I would only recommend that if you've already read all of the classic Lovecraftian stories first, like uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth, The Call of Cthulhu, and so forth. Uh, okay. Because you kind of need a grounding for her stories to make sense. Uh -huh. um, okay. There's so much good stuff. Uh, the new Lovecraft Circle, which uh, actually I've got some books over here. Um, although I suppose I shouldn't be looking away from the camera, but uh, there's the new Lovecraft Circle. Uh, there's the Black Wings stories. Um, there's a whole ton of stuff out there. And the reason I mentioned the Ruthana Emery story in particular is because she takes a different point of view. And what constitutes evil is a little more complicated in her setting. Ooh, and like some that. people really like it and some people don't. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the story of Wintertide is set after the Japanese concentration camps that we had here in this country, uh, <laughs> where we interred the Japanese. I guess I shouldn't say concentration camps. I should say internment camps. When they were opened up and people released, one of our main characters was released along with a couple people captured from the Innsmouth raid. So it's a very mm -hmm. different point of view because some of our main characters are associated with the mythos. Ah, I see. Okay. Very cool. There's yeah. a whole morality. It's pretty neat Maybe, stuff. Sorry, go ahead, Andre. No, go ahead. I was pretty much done. Okay, so, you know, today I just finished writing a script that you guys would probably find. Andre would definitely like. I don't know about the other two of you, but okay. So check this out. You, you remember um, From Beyond? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So 
imagine a uh, augmented reality game like Pokemon Go that's mm-hmm. played wearing glasses that allow you to see the monsters as you're walking around town, and then you have some kind of device that you capture them with. And it turns out, as you're wearing the glasses, it starts modifying the brain to the point where you realize that all these monsters you've been capturing are real. Ooh. They've been swimming around us all along. That oh. sounds cool, and that so, definitely sounds very from beyondish. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, it is. Does it is this this program or whatever stimulate the pineal gland to grow or something? Is that? Yeah, I'm going along. It's stimulating something in the brain that's not going to be clearly specified during the story because I'm writing this as a short. Um, right. But the idea is that as you play the game, the creatures eventually start noticing you, oh, and initially no. most of them. Most of them don't really care about you. They're just there. They're right. like fish, you know, or whatever right, right. in the ocean. It's, but, it's the um, ones that do care right. you have to worry about. Right. Yes. Eventually, there's going to be something bad out there. I don't want to play this game, Steve. <laughs> this is not a good game. I don't care if they're there so long as they don't see me and I don't see them. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I don't want the glasses. I'm good. I, I keep that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Very cool. That sounds cool. All right. Well, let's wrap this up. All right, Andre, thank you. Andre, again, I'm going to give out his links one last time. Make sure you go to GameSoapbox.com and check him out on RPG Now, Lucid Dreams Role Playing Engine. Andre does great stuff. He sent me a copy of the game to review. Uh, I like it. It's a very cool game. I could see playing it. I could, Steve, maybe we could work that into our our rotation, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? all right, everybody, thank you for, for signing in. I am going to run the closer now, so let me do the, do this thing right here. All right, you have just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Myth Wits. We're live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions or just banter with the other Mythfits, much like David Benavides and Paul Noons and... Uh, 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 Mama Marsh. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Sorry, Mike, I had a brain fart. Uh, find us on Facebook and Twitter as Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher, or you can just listen at mythwits.podbean.com. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out tsrpn.com for more cool shows. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it, don't sell it, and don't use it to summon the old ones make sure to check out studio187.com for more cool stuff and join our mailing list thanks everybody for listening tell your friends to tune in and until next week mike we live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity and it was not meant that we should go voyage far